So today I'm joined by James Howard Kunstler, who is a former editor at Rolling Stone magazine and a prolific author and runs his podcast as well as his blog, uh, Clusterfuck Nation. So welcome, James. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So James, why don't we start with uh, kind of going back a little bit about some of your work at Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, Tell me uh, maybe a uh, example of something that you covered at Rolling Stone that you thought, wow, that was- Oh dear, that was a long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah, you know, I was, uh, I was a journalist uh, back in the 70s and I, you know, a corporate journalist. I worked for the Hearst newspapers and then Rolling Stone was looking to professionalize and they started hiring young people who had newspaper experience and I was one of them. And at the time, my, my, my duties were actually, I was one of three editors in the music department and uh, my main job was to write the gossip column every two weeks called Random Notes. So, you know, there was nothing really especially interesting about that. You know, I, I did meet a lot of rock and roll stars and, uh, you know, then I dropped out to write books. Now, uh, you've written a lot of books. You, you've spoken uh, all over as well. Are there some common threads that, uh, you know, go across some of your books as well as your writings? Yeah, th there, are, there are common threads. I, I kind of started, uh, I, once I left journalism, corporate journalism, I started to write novels because that was the programming for people with amb uh, literary ambitions back in uh, the 20th century. They're not quite the same anymore. Uh, but eventually I got back into journalism and nonfiction, started writing for the New York Times Magazine. And one of those stories turned into a book proposal for uh, my first nonfiction book, which was called The Geography of Nowhere. And that was largely concerned with the fiasco of suburbia and how it, it was a kind of economic, spiritual, and ecological catastrophe for our culture and what we were going to do about it. Um, it's really deformed uh, social relations terribly. And um, that led me to... Uh, uh, to explore the energy situation. And that led to another book called The Long Emergency, which was about the global energy uh, predicament and also the economic spin-offs of it. Uh, after that, I wrote a book called Too Much Magic. And the subtitle of that was uh, Technology, Wishful Thinking, and the Fate of the Nation. And uh, so there's a theme running through all of this that uh, the, the living arrangement that we've developed in America for, you know, for everyday life it has really been harmful to our culture and our economy and our souls. And that the, the main thing that it depends on, a uh, 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 predictable supply of energy, is in danger. And uh, we're going to have to make new arrangements for daily life in this country. It's a tremendous problem because we, we're kind of stuck in the, what I call the psychology of previous investment, meaning we've put so much of our national wealth into this, this, uh, this uh, infrastructure for daily life that we can barely imagine changing it or, or letting it go. And that's, a, that's an enormous problem for us. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, starting point to have a, a discussion around, which is that both in the case of uh, suburbia sprawl as well as our reliance on oil and gas is that fundamentally a lot of these things are infrastructure and ecosystem based. We're yeah. so heavily dependent upon it, the capital system, the political system, uh, the private sector, they're all dependent upon these uh, economic blocks, and they're so heavily invested into it that it's difficult for them to divest or look for alternatives. In the case of uh, urban uh, or suburbia, you have developers, and for them, it's cheaper to develop in remote lands, away from metros and, and urban areas, but that's also caused a lot of issues, everything from resources that we're consuming to some of the wildfires that we're seeing in California. Uh, because you're just too remote, too close to the forest, as an example. Uh, what is, you know, aside from the economic, what is, why are we continuing to see more of this sprawl out instead of building upward? Well, it's really due to the customs and practices that have uh, come along in the uh, property development industry. Uh, the, the laws that we've created and the codes that we have for building and zoning. And that has created a template for 
uh, a, an armature for daily life that has no future. And it's a very unfortunate thing. Now, I, I became associated with a group called the New Urbanist Movement back in the 90s. And that, that was a group that was devoted to reforming the way that we develop uh, land in America and, and, and indeed the, the settlement pattern in general. And they were proponents of the traditional town, traditional ta town planning, the traditional neighborhood, and the, rela the physical relationships between things on the landscape um, in that kind of pattern. Uh, they've been quite successful in reforming a lot of municipal codes around the country and putting up projects that are kind of demonstration projects to show people that you could build something in new construction that wouldn't be some kind of a sickening suburb. Um, and I, it's been a very successful movement, but, you know, they're only responsible for a fraction of a percentage of the development that's gone on in America. In the meantime, we're kind of just sleepwalking into the future, going through the motions, doing what we've done for the last 75 years, you know, without thinking a whole lot about it. Now, if you look at some of the bigger macroeconomic trends and reports, uh, it, there is a rise in what they call mega cities. So it's defined as cities that have 10 or more million people, and some cities are projected to exceed 100 million people. And Forget about it. And these cities are not based in traditional North America or Western Europe. These are places in China, India, and places in the Middle East. And as we are seeing in places like India, for instance, you have masses of people coming into urban settings, but they don't have the infrastructure to actually support that kind of a growth. What, how do we support the future and, 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 and making sure that we can actually support that growth as well as the urban lifestyle? We're not going to support that kind of growth. And in fact, it would be a mistake to think that the trends that are underway now are necessarily going to keep on going indefinitely. In fact, w what I would say is that the, the great cities in the United States especially, you know, I, I know more about the USA because I live here, but the great cities of the USA are going to have to contract substantially. And the process is going to be difficult, although uh, we will be compelled to do it by circumstances. The, the, the cities have acquired a scale that is inconsistent with the energy and capital resources of the future. They're going to get smaller. They will get smaller. There will be battles over who gets to inhabit the parts of the cities that still have value, uh, namely the parts near the waterfronts, the harbors, the um, the, uh, the, the old urban cores, the historic cores. And um, the action is going to change and shift to the places that have seen the most disinvestment in the USA. Um, the small towns, the places that have a meaningful relationship with agriculture, because we're going to have tremendous problems in the future with industrial agribiz style agriculture. And... Uh, uh, we're going to have to grow a lot more of our food locally. Um, so the cities are uh, really have a different fate than most people imagine. Now, I just want to explore that a little bit. You're saying that uh, metropolitan uh, areas in the U.S. is going to actually contract. What do you mean by contract? And then the other thing is you mentioned beachfronts and coastal areas. Those are going to be subject to uh, sea, sea average sea rise due to climate change and the melting of the Arctic. So help me to understand, because this seems somewhat inconsistent with some of the studies that's coming out. Yeah, um, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, many of our coastal cities may be threatened by uh, climate issues. And that's true, uh, could be. But uh, what, what I'm thinking more uh, uh, specifically about is the fact that uh, we're going to the inland waterway system of America is going to... Uh, become a much more important thing in the future because we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to rely on trucking. We're not going to electrify the truck system. Uh, the, the trucking system is going to uh, fade away. We're going to have to move people and stuff. Uh, our railroad system's in pretty sad shape, and we haven't shown any willingness or interest in reviving it over the last 25 years, uh, which we should have done. It's, uh, it's getting a little late in the game for that. But uh, the interior of America, we have a wonderful inland waterway system, you know, that consists of the Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi uh, system, the Great Lakes, 
the, uh, the Hudson River estuary and the canals that connect to the Great Lakes and to the St. Lawrence. And the cities uh, in those places are probably going to regain importance, although they'll never be the giant cities that they were in 1957. You know, St. Louis and Cincinnati and, and places like that will, will probably be smaller than they have been. But they're going to be important again in a way. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about energy. Um, so what are your views about uh, oil and gas and, and, and the transition to variable renewable energy? Well, you know, the American public has been kind of uh, uh, lulled and gulled into thinking that we don't have a problem with uh, petroleum anymore because of the shale oil miracle. But uh, the truth is that shale oil has been a kind of a financial and technological stunt. Uh, the whole thing runs on enormous amounts of borrowed money. And they, they did produce a tremendous uh, increase in, in oil production over the last 10 years. But uh, they did it by racking up tremendous amounts of debt. And now they're demonstrating that they can't make money doing it. Uh, about 90% of the companies involved in shale oil don't make a red cent producing shale oil. They've got all this borrowed money that they owe, and the likelihood is they're, they're going to have trouble getting new loans in the future uh, to continue the production rates that they've achieved. So I regard the shale oil thing as really a, a, a stunt uh, that is going to go down as quickly as it went up. And, and let's remember the geology of shale oil is such that it's very different from conventional oil. Shale oil wells tend to fall off by 60 to 80 percent after the first year of production, and after three or four years, they're gone. And so unless they keep up this massive redrilling and fracking, uh, they're, you know, the, the production is going to fall. And I think, an, I think Americans are going to be disappointed by how this plays out, and they will certainly be discommoded when our oil supply goes down again, and, and it will. So... It's been an unfortunate decade, and it, it's really uh, too bad that we didn't start making other arrangements for daily life in this country um, sooner. Now, you mentioned uh, highly leveraged debt, and of course, a lot of that is also subsidies coming from the governments in different forms. So as long as the government is involved and different sectors are essentially propping it up, that artificial cost structure is going to continue and create an artificial marketplace, so to speak, and that distortion that you're talking about. Whereas if we had the true cost of it, we would switch over to, let's say, uh, something that's more sustainable much sooner. Uh, but we're certainly not seeing that definitely in the U.S., maybe a little bit in the uh, EU side. Um, so how do we start to address that distortion? Well, I, I don't think it's quite correct to say that uh, shale oil is running on, on government subsidies. It's really running on private investment. Uh, and, you know, it's been a problem for private investors to find a, uh, some kind of a, a place to put their money that actually yields some kind of uh, return. And uh, many of the instruments that are out there, you know, um, uh, are, are janky instruments that, that uh, uh, people don't want to invest in. And you can't, you know, the interest rates are so low that, uh, it, you know, it's hard to get yield from, from many bonds. So, so they uh, ran into shale oil, and but you know, unfortunately, now that the companies have proved they can't make money, they're going to run out. Now, as far as uh, alternative energy is concerned, uh, we're going to be disappointed by how that works out too. You know, there's a lot. This is that was the subject of my book, Too Much Magic, which is uh, a discussion of what I call techno narcissism. The idea that there are a lot of rescue remedies out there that are going to help us get through this bottleneck easily. Uh, we're going to be disappointed by alt energy. Uh, we're going to do as much as we can, but we're going to discover that producing the hardware for it, the wind turbines and the solar cells, is really entirely dependent on a fossil fuel platform beneath it to make that stuff happen. And... Uh, uh, if we do wind and solar in, you know, it's not going to be in ways that we expect or at the scale that we expect. We're really going to have to change our living arrangements much more drastically. Uh, we're not going to run Disney World, the U.S. military, the interstate highway system, suburbia, uh, uh, or any of the other uh, uh, accessories and furnishings 
of today's life on any combination of wind, solar, dark matter, used French fried potato oil, or other things that we're fantasizing about. You know, th there are much more comprehensive changes that we have to make in our living arrangement. And mainly, we have to find a way to live, uh, you know, in compact uh, communities, compact towns at a scale that uh, comports with the energy and capital realities of the future. So one of the interview, uh, interviews that I had prior to this is with uh, uh, a gentleman out of Europe, and he's a designer, and he's created a closed-loop shower system where basically he recycles the shower water uh, so that you're basically able to reuse that water over and over again to a great extent. Um, but one of the things that he and I talked about, and I've heard this in many, many other cases and read about it as well, is this notion of behavioral change. A lot of what you're talking about is you're asking people to move away from suburbia, move into compact urban living, change their consumption model, change their behavior, change their energy use. How does that play into the psyche of the American public? Not very well because uh, of the psychology of previous investment. We don't want to change. We've, we've invested our national treasure in all of these systems, and we don't want to let go of them. Um, I, I think the actual fact of the matter is that we will be compelled to change our behavior, whether we like it or not. We're going to be dragged kicking and screaming into a new disposition of things, and it's a mistake to think that, uh, it's, a, it's a bit hubristic to think that everything depends on our preferences. You know, history has mandates of its own. Reality has mandates of its own that will require us to do things uh, whether we like them or not. And so that's, talk, that's where this is headed. So let's talk about 2008 Great Recession. So you could talk about the greed, you could talk about the speculation, but, you know, consumers are not free of guilt either. I mean, they were the ones that were also purchasing homes in suburbia, multiple homes, uh, rental homes in some cases, leveraging debts and so forth. Um, and then all of that, at the end of the day, even though it's a private sector doing it, who's actually warranting or, or supporting or propping up those banks? It's still the government. So we've gone through a massive upheaval, economic upheaval in 2008. Yet what do we learn from it? Has anything changed? Well, I'll tell you what we didn't learn from it, unfortunately, uh, is we didn't learn that this was a form of racketeering. And we need to develop a vocabulary, you know, a lexicon of the proper words to understand what we're dealing with. And what we're dealing with in a lot of activities in America is not necessarily capitalism, it's racketeering. You know, racketeering is capitalism done dishonestly. Um, it is the, you know, the, the attempt to get money dishonestly. And that's what, you know, interestingly, that kind of racketeering has shown up in two of the activities in our country that you'd think would be the most uh, um, averse to racketeering, and that's education and medicine. You know, education is, its prime mission is the pursuit of truth, and medicine's, medicine's uh, mission is to, uh, uh, you know, make people well and do no harm. And yet both of them have turned into odious rackets, bankrupting uh, much of America. Uh, the racketeering is present in just about, you know, everything that we're doing and banking and finance is, is uh, you know, uh, one of the main locations of it. We didn't do a thing to reform it, really. And the trouble is we can't run our society now without borrowing immense amounts of money from the future. And that borrowing, that debt accumulation has invited a great deal of uh, misconduct and and, and racketeering in its attempt to kind of paper over the problems that we're having. So when you say racketeering, are we talking about things like uh, lobbying, uh, special interest groups? Because a lot of what we're talking about is the economic incentive structure that maintains status quo, the way things have been always been done. Uh, as long as the private sector and the relationship with the government bureaucrats and the provisioning, everything from land use permits and so forth, continues, it, it promotes and supports and facilitates racketeering. Yeah, I, I'd say that, you know, racketeering, uh, because it's a group endeavor, uh, naturally requires, uh, you know, a lot of consensual behavior, a lot of people who agree with, you know, w what each other are doing. So it's a, it is a, you know, a very large matrix of behaviors that 
enables things to happen, uh, you know, in a dishonest way. And, and for us, it's unfortunate be because, you know, I don't think we're being dishonest for the sake of being dishonest. I think we're doing it because we're, we've run out of options. And uh, if you don't really have the economic or the financial mojo to run your society as it's been set up to run, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to try to do it by other means, and they tend to be uh, underhanded and dishonest. And a lot of it, of course, uh, revolves around the immense amounts of borrowing money that we have to do, you know, uh, and creating money out of thin air uh, by the Federal Reserve. So that whole matrix is fraught with uh, opportunities and pitfalls for people to misbehave. So for listeners that are, uh, you know, listening to some of these very heavy, uh, complex topics, it's very easy to lose hope and be uh, in despair. What, what's your final word of wisdom around how can people have a sense of purpose and cheerfulness and look to the future and be optimistic? Well, that's a very important question. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the problems with thinking of ourselves as consumers is the idea that, you know, stuff comes to us, you know, for, from, from outside of ourselves uh, to support us and support our lives, both physically, materially, and spiritually. But in fact, we have to generate hope and purpose within ourselves. And, and we, we can only do that by, you know, undertaking behavior and, and um, uh, goals that are meaningful to us and, and putting our shoulder to the wheel and, and demonstrating to ourselves that we're competent. For example, if we had made a national effort to rebuild the railroad system in America so that we could anticipate the, the transportation problems that we're facing ahead, uh, we would have a lot of confidence to go forth and uh, uh, reorganize other systems that we depend on for our daily life, like the agriculture system. You know, sooner or later, agribiz based on oil and natural gas is going to get into a lot of trouble. You can argue that it already is. Uh, and that is a system that we're going to have to reorganize. Um, so uh, the, the pathway to hope uh, and, and to uh, purpose is, is self-generated, and we have to generate it by, by uh, uh, working ourselves to do the things that we can do to uh, change our behavior and uh, make this country, allow this country to get through the bottleneck that it faces. Great advice. Thank you for that. Now, how can people follow your work uh, as well as your books, your writing, and podcasts? Well, my, wor my works, uh, my books are all available at the, in the usual places, your independent bookstores. There are not very many left, but uh, I do suggest that you, you use them because we need them to stay, stay alive. And um, they're also on my website, kunstler.com, K-U-N-S-T-L-E-R.com. I publish my twice weekly blog clusterfuck nation on mondays and friday mornings and uh, it's always there by 10 o'clock uh, i put out a podcast about once a month with uh, guests who i interview myself and that's pretty much how i roll these days um uh, i'm not you know i i remain cheerful I, i'm not a pessimistic person even though i i have to trade in rather dark ideas and scenarios in in the work that i do but I'm pretty cheerful. I lead a purposeful life. You know, I grow my own food. I raise chickens. I play a lot of music. I think these are the things that are going to sustain people in the years ahead as uh, we return to being a, uh, uh, a, a nation of people who get to know their neighbors and actually, uh, you know, rebuild our families and, and rebuild our society. So today I've been joined by James Howard Kunstler. Thank you, James, for joining. It's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for having me on.